Hi, my name is Anira Matthews, and I'm the Research Services Librarian for the Douglas and Henry Academic Centers. March is Women's History Month, and Mercy University Libraries is proud to celebrate this month on behalf of our students, faculty, and staff. And today, I'm joined here with Dr. Jackie Pinkowitz, who is the Assistant Professor of Media Studies at Mercy University. And today, we'll be discussing women in media. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Pinkowitz. Of course, happy to be here. My first question is, why is Women's History Month so significant? Because women are significant. Um, I think every month should be Women's History Month. Um, When I was thinking about this question, one, there's a kind of general answer of, well, patriarchy has devalued and marginalized and oppressed and rendered women invisible for hundreds of years now. And so um, I think having any kind of declarative moment in time that is about celebrating, making visible, um, acknowledging, and kind of centering and celebrating women is is always important because those patriarchal oppressions, they they only continue. Um, The other thing that I think is really important about Women's History Month is that it's not just about celebrating women and women's lives and the kinds of contributions and that they have made and struggles that they have gone through, but that it's also rooted in the fight for suffrage, for women's suffrage and the right to vote, for women's civil and equal rights. And that is also a fight that continues into the present. So when we think about Women's History Month, we have to also think about that struggle, that fight, that kind of tradition of collective action and activism, particularly as women's rights and freedoms are very much, I would say, under attack. But I think that's a euphemism, like they are being stripped away Um right now, uh, women's reproductive rights, trans women's rights to exist and be themselves. Um, women are still undervalued, underpaid, underrespected, and underrepresented in most major professions. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do, and, and that's what we celebrate for Women's History Month. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about women in, women in the media. Uh, media is such a broad term, so like, what does that, uh, what is media, and what does that like encompass? Great question. Um, The good thing about media and why I like to study media is because basically anything goes. Media kind of textbook definition is any form of content or message or communication that is transmitted through some kind of technology. So rather than you and me, I mean, technically, I guess this is media, right? Because Zoom is happening. But if you and I were just to talk, right, that's a conversation. There's nothing mediating or coming in between that message. Once you introduce technology and technology, there could be anything. It could be the printing press. It could be a TV, you know, broadcast station or a TV set all the way up to our smartphones and the Internet. Um, all of that counts as media. So we've got what we've got publishing and print. Um, we've got telephone technologies and now satellite technologies, broadcast, radio and television, now cable and satellite television as well, film and video and recorded sound. Right. So music, podcasts, all that stuff. And then, of course, the Internet is all those things are coming together. They're all blurring quite intensely. Um, but to your question, I think media is sort of anything and everything that's published or promoted or produced on a kind of technological mass scale. So it includes entertainment media and news and journalism. It includes, you know, commercial entertainment produced by Hollywood, as well as avant-garde experimental media. And it includes sort of narrative driven storytelling, as well as things like promotional or advertising material. So all that counts as media. Um, My next question is, um, how have women advocated for themselves in the media in terms of like taking on leadership positions, especially from like a historical perspective? Yeah. Um, so I think for this conversation, I'm going to stay focused on film and a little bit of television because it has them, it's easy to keep kind of the conversation tight around that. Um, for the history of Hollywood, there's not a whole lot of opportunities for women. Um, for the most part, from like the 1920s until like the 1990s. <laughs> 1970s, 1980s a little bit, right? We've got the feminist movement. We've got the women's movement. There's a whole push to um, expand the spaces for women across the board of American and global culture, societies, professions, et cetera. But we see this really interesting kind of surge of women in the film industry, right? When film is a brand new thing, when when it no one's quite sure what it's going to do yet or how it's going to be. Um, it's a lot of amateurs and kind of do it yourself and figure it out. And this is a brand new technology. It's kind of like the Wild West of this new, this brand new medium, right? And in the beginning, 19, 1900s, 1910s, into the 1920s, women are doing everything. They are filling every role in Hollywood. They are directing, they're writing, they're editing, they're coloring the images, they're setting 
setting scenarios and doing costuming. And it's really once the industry starts to solidify around um, big money and big business um, that women start to get pushed to the side. The industry becomes more corporatized, more commercialized, and men start to make all the decisions. They run the companies, the studios, and then they sort of push women into the roles that are not deemed as, as important, right? So costumes, makeup, these kind of feminized spaces. Um, and that doesn't leave a lot of space for women. That said, at least in the way that we might think about leadership, right? There's lots of power and um, success and opportunity for women, particularly as stars. They are the, the kind of driver of the motion picture industry, their driver of what we think of as Hollywood. It's women stars and women audiences, right? They're, they're very, very important. And so even if we look to this history where we wouldn't actually think of women in like leadership positions per se, women stars are doing amazing work to sort of push beyond the, the limits of what that looks like and to push back against the male um, the male dominated studio system. So one of my favorite examples is Olivia de Havilland. Um, she, if you know her, you slash whoever's watching or listening, you might know her from Gone with the Wind. She plays Melanie, who is like the, the boring one, right? She's like the good girl, um, very noble, very proper woman in contrast to Scarlett O'Hara, right? Who's like the renegade. But off screen, um, Olivia de Havilland was, oh my God, she was a firecracker. She was amazing. Um, so she was always getting typecast into these um, these more like traditionally feminine roles and she wanted to do something else and she refused. So the studio said, you have to play these roles. She said, no. So they suspended her because they had total control over her contract. She worked for Warner Brothers. And so she just didn't work. She lost out on like months and months and months at the prime of her career because she refused to play by the rules. And then Warner Brothers, um, decided that they were going to add that suspension time onto her contract. So she was under contract for seven years. Um, it was a very exploitative labor system in which stars were put under contract to a specific studio for seven years. And Warner Brothers wanted to take all of her suspension and add it to the end so that she'd be under contract for like eight years, maybe more, right? She sued. Even though people had sued before and lost, she took on like the entire industry system, sued Warner Brothers, and won. It's amazing. Um, she sued them for violating unfair labor laws and like basically debt peonage laws. Um, and that law is still on the books. It's still in place and it's still called the de Havilland law in her honor. So maybe not leadership in a kind of traditional sense, but women who are like taken charge and, and sort of pushed back against those restrictive power dynamics. I have one more example if there's time. Okay. Yes. Um, the other example I wanted to talk about for thinking about leadership roles, uh, is Shonda Rhimes because Shonda Rhimes is, I mean, she's, she's, uh, how can, what can you say about Shonda Rhimes? Um, but I think she's a really good example. One for the kinds of opportunities that women, let me rephrase opportunities that television provides for women and by extension, sort of people of color, queer people, um, maybe non-American folks, anyone who's sort of not in the dominant right now in particular, there's a kind of expanded space because of how much content is being made for television, how many opportunities there are. But Shonda Rhimes is a really good early example of working that system and then rising to the top and being really smart, really savvy, really strategic about how to do that. So she starts at Disney, starts as a screenwriter and a TV writer. She writes Crossroads, if anyone remembers Crossroads with Britney Spears. Um, and it's when she launches Grey's Anatomy that everything sort of changes, right? So she she parlays her work as a writer into being a writer and a showrunner on Grey's Anatomy. And if you're a showrunner, that's like such amazing power. It's still a role mostly held by men, but you get to call the shots, right? You hire who's in your writing room. You hire your producers. You hire your cast right? All those decisions are yours, which means she's making these female driven shows about women in power and leadership roles and high stress situations who take charge and handle it, right? Racially diverse and mixed casting, um, kind of pushing the boundary of what television can be for both women and race on screen. Um, and now we have Shondaland, right? So we go from Grey's Anatomy to Scandal to How to Get Away with Murder, to a $100 million deal with Netflix that woos her away from network television, $100 million to make anything she wants for Netflix, right? So again, thinking about like how she's able to really strategically um, insist on being in power in these ways that have creative control 
and will parlay her into ongoing and future opportunities. The next question is, who are some women in, in the media industry who have like pioneered the way for us today? A good and related question. And I should have given you the Olivia to, Olivia to Havilland example here. <laughs> Um, that's fine. That's fine. Let me think. Okay, what would be a good way to think about this? Maybe we just think about the history of women directors. Um, so again, if we go back to that history of thinking, okay, it's so like women are working in every aspect of the industry in the very beginning, and then they get sort of shoved to the side, right? But they never totally disappear. If we look just at directors, directors are a I mean, it's only one part of filmmaking, right? Filmmaking is this whole collaborative medium. You need hundreds of people to make a movie. If you're making a Marvel movie, you need thousands of people, right? But who gets the credit? The director right? The director is still a kind of coveted position. It's a very prestigious position. It has a lot of power. um, And it's mostly still controlled by men, right? Um, So if we look even at this particular position within Hollywood as a way of saying, okay, what is the trajectory of this over time? How have women directors always been there and sort of always tried to make things possible for the women coming after them? Um, We had two really amazing early film, female film directors, uh, Alice Guy Blaché and Lois Weber, who are working in kind of the early days of Hollywood. Again, historically, the men get the credit, people like D.W. Griffith, but it's people like Alice Guy Blaché who are actually sort of inventing a new way of storytelling, They're using this new technology in interesting ways, um, innovating shots and lighting and forms of storytelling. And they're not always remembered or included in those histories, but as feminist scholars, women's history scholars have located them, that's starting to get expanded, right? So you're starting to see the influence that they've had on all of American cinema, including potential spaces for women going forward, right? Um, In the classical era, uh, things get real bad. And it's a it's a man's show all across the board. Um, censorship comes into place, and there's a lot of restrictions on who can make what. Um, and we really get one female director working in the classical era. Her name is Dorothy Arzner. She was also a lesbian, um, an out lesbian woman, at least privately, not publicly, because that was not permitted um, in terms of keeping her job or keeping like her security, right? But she's a really good model to think about for future generations, I mean, still now, is how do you work in a system that isn't made for you, right? How do you work in a system that is hostile to to women, to queer people, to racial minorities, to people with disabilities, right? Like to Jewish people, right? An an industry that's incredibly normative and incredibly um, hostile in many ways. How do you work within that system and kind of slowly change the system from the inside out? And how do you make films that will speak to women audiences and queer audiences, even if the men producers don't realize it, right? Alice or um, Dorothy Archer is really, really good at that. Um, And then we get a bunch of amazing women doing stuff all through the 1960s and 70s in the independent realm and then kind of making their way into the mainstream. So that's another really good model to think about for if Hollywood's not interested and they're not willing to fund you or your projects or welcome you into the industry, like go make stuff independently. There's a whole other realm of production and and movie making and collaboration and community that can happen. And if any of those films go big, because, hey, women like to go to the movies, we'll probably watch them, right? You have a way in after that. So um, we get really important women in the 80s making romantic comedies and like proving that women audiences and women's media is valuable, like um, Nora Ephron and Penny Marshall. We get Catherine Bigelow in the 1980s and 90s, who refuses to identify as a woman director. She's just a director, right? And she insists on on sort of inclusion within the male-dominated industry, and she works exclusively in the male action genre to prove that women can do it just as well as men, and that's her sort of contribution, right? And she becomes the first woman to win the Academy Award for Best Director. So there's all these ways that you can sort of work within the system that exists and then change it from the inside out and make the kind of surge of female filmmaking that we have now more possible, not longer history. So my next question is, um, how have women of color um, broken into the media industry? We've had a harder time, you know, <laughs> obtaining media opportunities. So like how have like when women of color like made a way for themselves? So if we look at this longer term history of Hollywood, the opportunities for women are low. The opportunities for women of color are particularly low, um, particularly given that really up until the 1980s, Hollywood's not really in the business of making, let's let's say, we'll focus on African Americans, Blackness for this example. They're not really interested in making Black films. There isn't really um, 
an interest in addressing Black audiences or speaking to racially diverse audiences really until Black exploitation in the 1970s, which is this sort of starts as an independent movement, it kind of goes mainstream, and then the industry jumps on board because they think they can make money and they're right. Um, but Black exploitation, which is like popular action cinema in the Black power era, um, it's very masculine, very, very hyper masculine, aimed at a kind of traditionally male audience. And so it has limits in terms of what it offers for, let's say, Black women in the industry or on screen either, right? And so, again, we see this opportunity for Black women, let me rephrase, opportunities that Black women create for themselves or take advantage of that are happening outside of Hollywood, which then ultimately sort of creates the space to change Hollywood and American filmmaking. So we have really amazing, um, great female filmmakers from the US and abroad who are working in this group of underground films called the LA Rebellion, which comes out of UCLA in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, also part of this kind of black power, black arts movement of the, the late 60s into the, to the 1970s and to the 1980s. And they're making films like, for no money, uh, experimental, shot on the streets of LA, non-professional actors, and they're screened among the community, right? It's by Black people, for Black people at a time of really intense racial struggle, let's say, right? Um, and women are very much a part of that movement. They're making the films that are part of this underground challenge to how Black people had been stereotyped, erased, devalued, dehumanized in mainstream film and mainstream society, right? Um, one of the filmmakers to come out of that movement, her name is Julie Dash. She is, oh, she's the best. Um, she starts with a, with a first film, which is just a student film. And then she makes her first feature in 1991. It's called Daughters of the Dust. It is the first, do you know it? Daughters of the Dust is the first feature film to be theatrically distributed by a Black woman. 1991, right? So Daughters of the Dust is, I mean, you've seen it, you know, it is, beautiful, right? It is, it is exper not experimental, but it's alternative in its narrative structure and its stylistics and its cinematography and its poetics, but also in its representations of, of Blackness, this kind of Afrocentric lens, thinking about the American South and the African diaspora and the legacies of slavery. It's absolutely alternative in its depiction of women and Black women, this kind of matriarchal collective society of leisure and community and a joining of past and present. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful film, right? And totally independent. Took years to get that funding together. And it sells out in New York theaters because Black women audiences are so hungry for something that's for them and about them, right? And it, it does amazingly, all things considered, right? I mean, it's not a Marvel movie, but it makes all its money back and it proves that Black women will go to the theater. It proves that films like this need to happen, right? And then Julie Dash can't get an agent. No one will pick her up. She like cannot get a next feature filmed, right? And so these limits, even when you get these amazing pieces of art, these amazing films that are breaking all these rules in these kind of really important ways for women and women of color, the industry limits that remain. Um, but I still think that, that she is a really important kind of predecessor for the black women directors that we have now. Um, we get several who come up in like the 1990s. Um, so like Casey Lemons, who did Eve's Bayou. We've got Gina Prince Bythewood, who did Love and Basketball. So there is this like expanding moment in the 1990s where that kind of gains of these liberation movements, right? Women's movement, black civil rights, other civil rights movements are sort of coming together and you're seeing the kind of products of those. But also there's been this independent boom that produced all these challenges to Hollywood. And so Hollywood has to find ways to sort of try to keep up or accommodate those changes. But those, those changes and um, alternatives also produce opportunities for, for people who are not typically included in the industry. So women, people of color, queer people, et cetera. And there are all these, these independent film movements that are happening, like feminist film, Black independent film, queer independent film, it's all, all happening in this moment in the 1990s. And then it sort of like goes away to an extent. Um, and I think finally we're seeing this surge right now in the last five, maybe 10 years or so, a surge of, of sort of representation across the board, but particularly for women and for women of color coming out of um, well, the election of Trump, the realization that maybe our our the progress that we'd seen for gender is maybe not as secure as we thought it was. 
um, the violence and oppressions of patriarchy and toxic masculinity are maybe more apparent than we wanted to admit. And of course, the Me Too movement and the Oscar So White movement working together to sort of really push this particular media industry to change, right? And not just in terms of representation, right? But who it's hiring, who gets to make creative decision, what kinds of films are made for what kinds of audiences. And then all these people who'd been waiting, right? Who'd been working like in other places, people like Casey Lemons, right? Or Julie Dash, this is their moment then, right? And they're getting now bigger films like Harriet or Lovecraft Country or something, right? Um, so I think it's about the long game, right? And this moment and when sort of social change and push for action coincides with um, the shift that has to happen in the industry, right? Um, one final point I'll make if we're thinking about women of color and advances in the industry, we cannot not talk about Ava DuVernay, who's also the best. Um, she, she, I don't want to, she's not single-handedly responsible for that change, but she has helped a lot. There's a, a really interesting mix of like great timing, really hard work and really good work that sort of makes this perfect moment to make the change that she was going to make even kind of greater in its impact. Um, so she starts really with like an independent student film. And then her first real feature is Selma right? This major civil rights biopic of Martin Luther King Jr. It goes up for an Oscar nomination. There's a whole set of controversies that we don't have to go into, but she is snubbed, right? She's snubbed in a directing category, and then she loses Best Picture. And this is what helps launch the Oscar So White campaign to demand the Oscars, and by extension, all of the Hollywood industry change, right? Realize its own investments in white supremacy, realize its limits in terms of inclusivity and equity for both race and gender. And she's right at the heart of that movement, right? And she just pivots. She pivots and she goes to Netflix. So again, we've got a, an example of um, a woman moving from the studio to a streaming service and taking advantage of that opportunity there as an alternative. And she makes the 13th. And when they see us, right, these very socially engaged, racially specific and racially critical documentaries that are pushing back against these structures of oppression, of racism, of racial violence, right? And then she gets a wrinkle in time, right? So, well, I mean, she doesn't get it, right? But I mean, to, to have a major blockbuster level franchise attached film go to a woman director is still rare, go to a black woman director. She was the first woman to direct a movie over a hundred million dollar budget. Right. And that was not that long ago. Um, she's also working in independent television, right? So working with Oprah Winfrey for the own network, creating this amazing show called Queen Sugar. And for the first season, which is all, it's a black family in um, Louisiana. And the first season she insisted that all of the directors for every single episode and the crew would be women. So like once you've got a woman in this space, right? It's not to say that all women will act the same, but if you get women into these positions where they get a say in who gets hired, who gets the opportunity, like who's going to advance, right? From just a lowly AV all the way up to assistant director, who's going to advance from a PA bringing you coffee, up through the ranks, right? That kind of stuff won't happen unless those people are there behind the scenes pushing for that change. And Ava DuVernay is a really good example of how to really make that work and make it happen. So my last question, um, so what are some resources you recommend uh, that students, faculty and staff read or like watch to learn more about women in media? Um, I, one that I do recommend is uh, called Women in Media by Amy D'Amico. <laughs> and this is available as an ebook uh, for students to read. Um, but like, what are some other resources? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was thinking about this and I tried to get a, a kind of mix of options for people. So the one that I'll start with is everybody should read the essay. It's just an essay. It comes out in 1975. It's called um, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema by Laura Mulvey. And I assign this to my students all the time. A lot of them hate it. And that's fine. Laura Mulvey's essay, it doesn't necessarily age well, and it doesn't all still hold up, but it is one of the pioneering pieces of feminist film theory and really early film theory, film criticism in the modern era. And it's painfully still very applicable in terms of thinking about how women are 
constructed, positioned, represented on screen in terms of a kind of sexualizing, objectifying gaze, um, narratives and depictions that really limit their their agency and their full humanity um, in ways that are aligned with kind of heterosexual patriarchal desire and power. Um, classic. Got to read it. <laughs> Got to read it. Um, a really good corollary if we're thinking about screenings, there's this documentary called Misrepresentation, M-I-S-S -S, Representation, um, which is a really good sort of introduction to um, relatedly like the, the misrepresentation, the stereotype, the caricatures, the the kind of limited roles or limited spaces of representation, the, the lack of representation of women on screen in film and television, advertising, other media, but it connects it to the social world to think about the related lack of women in political office, for instance, right? Um, and there are these corollaries where if you don't see women as fully human or fully equitable or anything other than a sexual object to be consumed, that has consequences, right? It both reflects our patriarchal society and maintains it. Um, another good source I think is, it's just a book called The Female Gaze and it's by, who's it by? Alicia Malone. And I like this one because it's a really good intro for students, for undergraduate students in particular, um, because it's just a theory, it's like a whole collection of movies by women and explains some of the production history. It has quotes and interviews. It talks about like the critical reception. And so it's a really good sort of survey and overview of like, hey, you don't think there are women filmmakers? Hey, you don't know any movies made by women? You actually might. There's a whole lot of them, right? And they're like, it's a really nice sort of easy to read, accessible history for, for women's filmmaking. Um, the final resource that I thought would be really helpful to tell people about um, is a little bit more scholarly, a little bit more intense, but it's a collection called Doing Women's Film History, um, and it's by Christine Gledhill and Julia Knight. Christine Gledhill um, was one of my professors at NYU. She's a really amazing feminist scholar who works in issues of genre and melodrama and thinking about women's media, how different women's, um, how, how women audiences have been positioned differently or left out in different ways. And I think if we want to talk about Women's History Month and women in media, I think a collection that speaks to that very act of excavating women's film history, of doing women's film history is part of what makes these histories and these films and these women visible um, and keeps the record, corrects the record and keeps it going. Well, thank you so much. That was it. <laughs> Great. Um, and for more information about Mercy University Libraries, you can visit us at libraries.mercer.edu. Thank you.